comedy of man stars like this. Subjective. Why well, is no one find me funny? You need, you need a clapperboard? There you go. <laughs> My guest today has been an international headlining comedian for over 20 years now. I'm up to 20 years. Yeah. The website's obsolete. Yeah. You're a writer, a voice actor, a past radio presenter, mm. Mm. and TV personality. Sometimes. Whatever, whatever you feels on the mood. I'll do anything. Oh, well, almost. Yeah. It's my honour to introduce Simon Kennedy. Thank you, Max. It's good to be here, mate. Thank you. I really am just intimidated by your raw charisma. No, oh, look, it's, it's oozing out of every pore at the moment. It's kind of taking the whole thing <coughs> on you. That also could be paint fumes because I'm painting the house <laughs> as well. So. Might be. <laughs> yeah, that's what you can smell. Tell me about the life of a comedian. What got you into comedy to begin with? I got into comedy because I was working in, in uh, radio. I started in radio as a radio announcer. I, a radio announcer who wanted to do funny stuff. And I realised all the good jobs were going to stand up comedians on radio. So I thought, oh, well, I'll go and do that. So I, I went uh, and uh, did my first open mic comedy night in a pub in Sydney. Uh, and that was 20 years ago, uh, which is frightening to think of to consider um yeah, this september just past um nine, well 2019 was uh, 20 years since I, I started doing that and i actually really fell in love and got addicted to the rush of performing i really enjoy the crowd i love the, the feeling of making people laugh and uh, and that eventually started to overtake um i was still working in radio at the same time um but i really enjoyed comedy a lot more in the end yeah in radio these are it's a heavily researched medium very heavily researched so sometimes for comedians that's pretty exhausting because you're like let's let's do this and someone's going yeah that's not really our demographic we probably shouldn't do that and so uh, that might be yeah. chicks don't like that kind of stuff and we want more chicks listening but that's sort yeah. of how it works um so it is restricting i mean obviously you can't so you can't swear your head off all the time because there are, and you can't say certain things. There are broadcasting standards. It's all the data analyst fault, isn't it? It is so research. <laughs> it is. It, you know what it is? Uh, focus groups, Max. Focus groups. Um, I've been in radio, and where we've we've done stuff, hilarious shit, like really funny, really funny, and um, and then they'll put it to a focus group, and one person in that focus group of eight people says they don't like it. So they come back and they say, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore because um, someone in the focus group didn't like it. One person in a room didn't like it, so we're going to scrap it. That's how reactive it is. Jeez. So, <clears throat> but it can be a lot of fun. <laughs> 20 years is a long time, though. How the standards must have changed for what's acceptable and in terms of comedy, not just yeah. radio. Even on radio or on stage, yeah. Both. Yeah, it has changed a lot. Like I remember, I remember uh, probably 15 years ago doing um, a show with uh, Steve Philp, who's another stand-up comedian. Steve and I did a, a weekend Saturday morning breakfast show on Nova. And it was around the time something to do with the Beijing Olympics or something, I don't know what it was. And Jackie Chan was the, like, uh, the face of the Beijing Olympics at that time. He was all over these visa card commercials and we used to do like phone calls into the studio from like Arnold Schwarzenegger that was always me you know things like that you know just going out and going yeah hi Steve it's great to be here uh, talking on your show um, and then we, we'll do Jackie Chan so when I did Jackie Chan can't remember how it sounded but um, I remember someone from management coming and going yeah you can't do that that's racist I'm like oh and it wasn't like it wasn't uh, nasty. We weren't making fun of him. We were just, and I, and I, and I reflected on it. And at the time, it seemed ridiculous. 
but but now as we get on and on and on it, it is getting to the point where even doing an accent is ooh, is it or isn't it yeah uh, I've always been of the um, of the opinion that the content uh, and the context is um, determines whether it's racist no, or not especially in comedy <coughs> in yeah. comedy uh, what you say on stage is a joke and people sure. are starting to kind of lose that boundary between what's real and what's being said for a particular reason yeah some people miss the irony and that sort of thing so on stage you can get away with it because it's you in the room with a you know, hundred or so people and they can read you you can read them they can they can feel the mood and everyone's kind of like oh, no, I see what he's doing he's not being nasty I get what he's talking about yeah. you know like, there's a there's a grey area now uh, and I'm sensitive to that I'm, I'm aware of it um, it's going to be a bit scary it has changed, but I'm not. I'm not scared of change. I reckon it's okay. A lot of people go, "Oh, you can't say anything anymore. You can't." Oh, jokes you used to be able to make jokes about it. And it's like people who fight it um, are just not. A, they're not able to to adjust themselves. And you've got to adjust for the times. Yeah. You know, it used to be okay to make poofter jokes and make jokes about gay people. That, that was acceptable at one point, and it's not because it's not okay and it's not acceptable. It's not nice. Um, but once upon a time it was so is it good that we've changed yeah so I'm willing to change I'm willing to roll with the punches and see what happens yeah. across time though who have you found are the funniest people um do you mean just generally I mean you've performed for quite a lot of people I've performed with heaps of people and big names too like I've performed um, in Australia you know I've performed with probably most of the well-known comedians people know here, who are Australian comics. I've performed with some big names from overseas um, as well. But who, who do I find funniest? Yeah, that's funny, funnily enough, it's not the well-known ones. I actually find that the most well-known comedians, uh, the, the TV names, they're not the funniest. The funniest for me are the ones that no one's ever heard of. And, uh, and why no one's ever heard of them, I don't know. Is that because um, marketability? I don't know. The relatability of like an everyday man is more funny, I suppose, than some rich person who you can't really be on the same wavelength. As. Yeah, I think I think what it's all about what's marketable, and I think types um, go really well. Like, um, I think uh, I mean, there's a push for a diversity ticket at the moment, so so there's certainly a hunger from the media to put more faces of colour around and that's I think that's important um, uh, I think there's a lot of you know, I guess there's, there's comics who uh, uh, who fit a type you know like uh, and I, I, I think that there are some comics who don't fit a type and no one knows where to put them that's what I guess I'm saying is that there are comics who are so kooky so obscure and I find them really funny the ones that are so this guy's a whack job. That that I dig. I like that. But the media doesn't know where they where they go all the time. So right. the, one, the, the most well known comedian that that I think is hilarious is Sean McAuliffe. Sean McAuliffe is, and I think one of the most underrated comedians of our time. I mean, I'm glad he's on television because he's brilliant. But he's so bent, and I really dig him. Do you fit, do you fit one of those types? I don't know. I don't think I do fit a type. I think I'm. Uh, I, I think I float between worlds. I really do. I don't know, and that maybe I don't, maybe I'm just not. I'm not marketable, so that's why I'm not on television much. But yeah, so but, but me twenty years ago when I started out, I was twenty four, um, and like wow, you know. I mean, I was talking about. I was talking about very unrelatable stuff, and a lot of comics when they start do talk about a lot of masturbation jokes. <laughs> it's, it's like yeah, okay. I think the first thing that comes up on your webpage is a masturbation joke. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Maybe, Maybe you should update that. Yeah, well, you know, that's, you know, that's from back then. It's like a time capsule. <laughs> it is. A, that's right. It, it was there. It, it existed. Mm. But I probably don't do that joke now. Would you describe your life as a comedy? Tragic comedy, I think. Yeah. I think that's most people's lives. Yeah. I think comedy in life is, is there to, to uh, uh, relieve the pressure. Yeah. You know, and, and life is this pressure. And I think that, you know, I'm, I've always made jokes about tragedy or not about tragedy, sorry, because of tragedy. I've always done little jokes just to, to lighten the mood because um, I guess uh, 
you can't all stay in that in that uh, for too long. Um, I did it when I, when I was a kid. Like I, I was a, like a nine year old boy you know, who lost his dad. And when when that happens, you you've got to find a coping mechanism. Um, for some people, it's you know, you know hiding in a room reading books. For me, it was being goofy and and getting laughs. I liked that. I liked that better than pity. So I thought, yeah, I'll just milk that. So I just kept. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed. I still do enjoy the laughs. And can you turn something you say like an like a one off kind of offhand comment? Can you turn that into a bet? How do you how do you yeah. take a daily thought and write it down? Yeah, um, I find that a lot of my bits do come. They're rooted in reality. Um, I find that, um, and I just grow them from there. Like they all start with a truth, a point of truth, and. To make it work on stage, sometimes you need to, to build a world around it. Um, I've got a few jokes that, uh, on their own, they're like, where do they go? So I've got stories that I can put them into. Like, so instead of um, three different things that have happened, I just put them all into one thing that happened. So make, you know, so there's truth in it, but it's been manipulated to work as a story. <laughs> How do you control your emotional state when you're on stage? Because I'm thinking about the distractions and stuff. You must, mm. like, if, if there's a heckler, how do you control that anger and kind of turn it into a superpower against the crowd? Well, most of the time, the audience are with you. Like, they're on your side. They want, especially in a comedy club, they want you to win. They want you to, to make them laugh. Mm. And someone who's drunk and yelling at, at stuff, he's a pain in the ass to them. He's a pain in the ass to me. And they're like, they don't want him to disrupt the show. So they're already waiting for you to <laughs> rip him a new one. Like they, they want that to happen. Um, sometimes being that guy, not the guy yelling, but the guy just looking at him like, I hope you get ripped yeah. out. I, ho- I hope. Sometimes you don't have to go too <laughs> hard. Sometimes you don't have to go full on. Um, it doesn't take much, you know. Yeah. And and the audience laughs at whatever you throw back. And then they're like, oh, okay, and they shut up for the rest of the show. Yeah. Sometimes they've had a few too many and they're like, they, they get a bit brave and they keep going and you have to go a bit harder and really destroy them. The audience will go with that. <clears throat> Sometimes they keep going even after they've well and truly lost the battle and the war and you're like, oh my God, what is it? It's like a zombie heckler. It's like, you, you're dead. You have to know this, right? Uh, that's when security just take them out. Yeah. Because, like, you're just ruining the show now. That being said, I've only ever seen that happen once at a show. I've seen it a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sure you go to more comedy yeah. than me. Oh, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. But, but that is, um, that is, it's a shame when that happens because I would rather they go, okay, fair play. Hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm cooked. Oops. Um, that would be good. And then I leave them. Then I leave it be. Um, but if they just keep going. I had a, actually, I did a show last week where there was a, um, a guy, front row, I was headlining, I got up, and the guy in the front, he was so drunk, so drunk, he was just loud talking, I'm like, and I didn't even, I couldn't even get my first joke out, because of this guy, I'm like, dude, zip it, there's a show on here, and and it was really a worry, because I actually had to get, I got angry, and I never get angry, angry, I had to, I had to basically say, can someone get this guy out of here, I can't even be heard, because this idiot, um, he was so hammered, but it was fine. I could just call RSA, you know, don't serve this guy any more drinks than any left. So, um, so he was, but that was frustrating. Then I had to sort of like, okay, everyone, let's start again. Um, right. Sorry, I got a bit uh, angry there, but uh, uh, we won him over. But so that's, that's unfortunate, but um, sometimes uh, it can be fun as long as they know when to stop. Yeah. Well, it does sound like. You know, I think I was watching some of yours and you said, it's not a hard job if you're good at it. No. Like people would often say that. They say, oh, comedy must be the hardest job in the world. And I say, it is if you're shit. Yeah. It is. Um, but I watch that, but I do my research. Yeah, you, you do that well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, but if, you, if you're good at it, it's, it's a joy. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a real rush. It's an ego stroke <laughs> when it goes well. I'll be honest with you. It feels really good. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for... That's all the... That's it. Are gone. Done. Thank oh, you. Max, an absolute pleasure, mate, and uh, and all the best with the with everything. Thank you. I didn't.